Welcome back to our online Orthodox Catechism. This is the second to last session, and today we're going to be looking at the liturgy. We'll talk about its um, parts, but perhaps more importantly, we'll talk about its meaning and what it represents to us, particularly as Orthodox Christians. But I think what I have to say will be recognized by any Christian of a liturgical tradition. And uh, I'll get um, I'll get us started immediately by opening up, um, or by sharing my screen, I should say, if I can remember how to do that from week to week. Here we go. So here we can see an icon of our Lord serving the Holy Eucharist. And I've deliberately opened with this screen because I think it sets the tone for all of our meditations on the subject. At the pinnacle of what we do as Christians is the person of Christ who makes himself available to us by his body and blood and by his word in the celebration of the liturgy. Now, I am... Um, Sorry, but there we go. The first thing I want to do is look at the word itself. You'll have heard, I'm sure, various names applied to the liturgy. And there is a reason for this. Each word we use actually indicates something about what we do. In the first case, liturgy itself is liturgia. Um, a Greek word that means actually public service or work for the people. This actually uh, derives from uh, a practice whereby the um, patricians of society would um, make donation or, or uh, put forward um, uh, gifts for the whole of society. And in classical terms, that meant as much enriching themselves as others. But of course, as we take the word on, it has everything to do with um, uh, very much a reciprocal relationship between us as we return to Christ and that which Christ serves to us. But there are, of course, other words as well. The first is Eucharist, and that's the word we saw at the top of the, the icon in the last screen. Eucharist is a word, uh, again from the Greek, meaning thanksgiving, thanksgiving. And it is what we bring to uh, Christ who serves us in turn. And what we receive then is communion. So we make our thanksgiving and we participate in the communion of Christ's body. Now, considering this is an Orthodox catechism, you may not expect me to bring up the next word, but it is actually mass. And I'm deliberately using it partly because I know that we have Western Orthodox viewers, but also because it's a term that almost all of you will know anyway. I quite like it. The reason being, it comes from the Latin phrase, ite misa est, which of course means simply, this is the dismissal. The final line uh, used by ideally a deacon or a priest in the, in the Western liturgical setting. And it is the great sending out of the people. And there's huge theological significance to that, that I think we can reflect on regardless of whether we're coming at this from an Eastern or a Western perspective. And it has a lot to do with an image I shared with you, especially uh, when we were talking about the Holy Spirit a number of sessions ago. And if you don't remember that, we're going to do a bit of a revision now. But I need us to back up. We're talking about the divine liturgy, but we have to, in order to understand it, uh, review what we know about our relationship with God. And so here, I... Um, I'm re-presenting a slide I shared with you a number of weeks ago, and I will do that over the next uh, few slides. But we look at um, our state when God first creates us. We see there God, and 
as always with any imagery, it's going to be less than perfect because there's no way of depicting the, uh, the magnitude of the Godhead. But for our purposes, I've represented that by showing God simply in the form of half a circle, um, but he establishes creation in his image, in his image and likeness, or he establishes particularly humanity in his image and likeness. But creation is established in order to reflect God and to give him glory. But of course, we know that creation soon separates itself from God because of the sinful actions of humanity. And so we find a chasm that opens up. Now, I've got to, uh, before I go on to the next slide, I, I'm reminded that out of this creation, um, God calls a particular people. The way to bridge this gap between where God is and where creation is now is by um, a priestly act. And God establishes the people of Israel to serve in a priestly capacity. And in that case, priests undertake two particular duties. Priests represent God to the cosmos, God to creation, and they represent creation back to God. So there is both a downward and an upward movement of the priest's activity or to the priest's activity. At the same time, the priesthood offers sacrifice. And so if you can imagine, I'm deliberately moving my cursor back and forth up that central line, the smoke of burnt offering rising to where God is. The thing is, it's a symbolic act because we can assume when we consider the nature of smoke that it very swiftly blows away. The sacrifice offered by Israel is by its nature a temporal sacrifice. It is rooted in time. It dissipates, blows away, and needs to be continually renewed. So we have the people of Israel serving in the priestly capacity of offering sacrifice, bridging that chasm symbolically with the rising smoke, and representing God to the people and the people back to God. Because of the temporary nature of that work, God is unwilling to uh, let that remain as the status quo. And so we move then into this image. Knowing that um, the sacrifice and the priestly work of Israel is always going to be limited, God takes on the priestly work himself. He speaks his word into the world. The word takes on flesh. I've indicated that here with this star on our left as we see the screen right now. And the word then becomes the high priest. Father Jacob, if you can hear this, we have no sound. Okay, can you all hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for telling me that. Uh, I will back up, if that's okay, and go back to um, uh, the incarnation. Apologies if, if some of you have already heard this. I don't know what the glitch in our uh, Zoom uh, program is today, but nonetheless, I said in the past, in the last slide, that the children of Israel uh, were established, were called out from among the nations to serve as priests, representing us to God, God to us, and offering sacrifice to bridge the chasm. This is, uh, it, the temporal nature of this act is something that God then uh, replaces or um, um, recapitulates by speaking his word into the world. 
And so here we have his word taking on flesh. And hopefully you can see my cursor moving at that point, representing symbolically Bethlehem. By taking on flesh, he takes on the role of priest. He is now representing us in his flesh to God. He is also representing God to us in his teaching, in his healing. But that isn't the total of his ministry, for he walks amongst us until he comes to the point of sacrifice. He recapitulates sacrifice by um, going to the cross. He takes, if you remember, I indicated this is where the people of Israel stood in their offering of sacrifice. He um, fulfills what had been temporal by making it permanent once and for all on the cross. But of course, that isn't the end of the story. He then rises from the dead and walks amongst us for a short period, leaving us last minute instructions, you might say, preparation for his physical departure from the earth, represented here by the ascension, at which point he carries with him our very substance and fulfills the role of priest by uniting um, God's nature and our nature in himself. And so you'll recognize this diagram, but it relates directly to the liturgy. I'm going to move on then to the next slide. And here you can see I've layered over, at least I hope you can see, the floor plan of a church. The altar at the very top representing the place of God, the nave representing our, um, our place in the world, our pilgrimage, the narthex representing that point whereby we um, leave the world and enter into the life of the church, and the porch, that place that represents our, um, you know, our being in the world. Do you remember when I had when I showed the second slide? I said the word mass can be quite instructive. Ite misa est. And that's because of this diagram. We have a wonderful phrase to describe this. In Latin, it's called exitus et reditus. This is the exitus, the procession. The procession of God's word into the world. And this is the reditus the return of God's word to his place in heaven with the Father. And why it's so important is that when we participate in liturgy, it is us returning to the altar. It is us meeting um, God. It is us encountering the open gates of heaven. And in fact, in the Orthodox Divine Liturgy, as the holy doors open and close, we're um, on a microcosmic level reenacting that, uh, that passage between heaven and earth. Exitus et reditus, procession and return. And this is the nature of liturgy. This is us going to the altar of God, then being told, ite misa est, this is the dismissal. So we go out into the world, and here we return to undertake our service. So you might say that um, in the Latin tradition, the word used to describe the service is taken from this part. In the uh, Orthodox tradition, liturgy is used to describe this part. It's only a matter of emphasis. Eucharist is what we bring with us, the thanksgiving, and communion is what we take away. In other words, what God grants to us. By doing this, we are undertaking, think back to last week, an iconological, or I, better yet, an iconographic function. In other words, we are actually 
um, enacting both an icon of the incarnation, an icon of Christ, but also an icon of the Holy Trinity. So I'm going to pause there, actually, before I go on to the more practical elements, because this is vital to understand the richness of our action and just see if there are any um, questions or comments. Um, anything at all so far, because I don't want to move on from, from this section without, um, without uh, making sure it's clear with all of us. Uh, yes, Father David. Yeah, uh, are you going to talk about the parts within the liturgy where the, the priest comes out um, and goes back in or? I am, I okay. am. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, um, you're all making it far too easy on me. That is the sort of theological basis on which we operate. And this is the practical basis. The liturgy is made up of multiple parts. And now, of course, I'm going to be speaking primarily about the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom and the liturgy of St. Basil. The first thing I'll say is that those of you who are inquirers into the Orthodox faith right now will have realized on Sunday that we um, switched our liturgy, that things got a little bit longer. And this is because um, whereas normally throughout the year we celebrate the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, now that we are in Lent for the next five weeks, including the first Sunday of Lent, we celebrate the liturgy of St. Basil. Now, the difference between these two liturgies is minimal in terms of how you experience them, except for by way of length. The principal difference is in the anaphora in the Eucharistic prayer. And what I would urge all of you to do, if you want an edifying exercise at this point in your Lenten journey, um, is to uh, look up the anaphora of St. Basil and simply to read it. There is nothing more wonderful, nothing more comprehensive in terms of what we do and what we are about as Christians, I think, than the fullness of that anaphora. And I have to say that when I first entered into uh, the altar of the Eastern Church and experienced it, when my priest, who acted as a real mentor to me, explained that he actually, for all it took out of him, loved the liturgy of St. Basil almost more than the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, I thought he was merely um, talking piously. Now that I have the privilege of serving that liturgy myself, I have to say that its words are so utterly immersive and exquisite, you cannot help but um, stand on the altar knowing that you are doing everything that the Christian is, is called to do. So please um, do enrich your own experience by making sure you read through the fullness of the anaphora, the Eucharistic prayer, the liturgy of St. Basil. But what I'm saying now actually applies to both liturgies because in that respect, they're, con they're constructed in exactly the same way. Other than the anaphora, you won't notice many differences. So in the first instance, the liturgy is divided into two parts, the liturgy of the catechumens, and the Liturgy of the Faithful. They're named thus because the Liturgy of the Catechumens is centered on the Word. And what do we do as catechumens, that is, as learners, but listen to the Word? We are being prepared by the Word to enter even more deeply into the, into the mystery. And uh, so the first half of the Liturgy is is uh, a, is an opportunity um, for that. The liturgy of the faithful, by contrast, moves from uh, listening to uh, observing and participating even on a physical level. The liturgy of the faithful is, of course, when the elements, the sacred elements, are placed then on the holy table and prayers are offered and they become mystically for us, the body and blood of Christ. 
But that's not all, because um, if you want to keep the liturgy um, sort of simply divided in your mind, you can say that it unfolds in two parts. But in fact, within the parts are roughly equivalent parts. And I'm going to show you that now. So take a look at how the diagram has developed. Liturgy of the Catechumens, a title which I've moved over to the left, and Liturgy of the Faithful, they remain. But the Liturgy of the Catechumens begins with a preparation, a time of preparation. That includes, um, of course, the uh, Great Litany, by which we start the liturgy, a series of hymns called antiphons. They are normally, well, uh, or they, they will be psalms, in fact. Um, there's, and, and the third antiphon is actually the recitation of the Beatitudes. So it's, it's prayers, um, psalms, and then uh, the Treparian, Kontakion, Theotokion, which are hymns essentially that um, anchor our celebration in a given week, in a different, in a given period in the cycle of the church's life. If there is a special feast, we include that, and so we sing a hymn that is appropriate also to, to the feast. Then we get into the Protimenon and the Apostle. The Apostle is simply the epistle reading. We say Apostle because um, it just means it's, it's a reading of the Apostle. Okay, and that could be uh, an epistle reading, but it also could be from the Acts of the Apostles. All of that prepares us then to um, hear the gospel, but not before we have processed out of the altar with the gospel in hand. The gospel is a sacramental artifact. I hate that word, but bear with me. It's a sacramental um, artifact insofar as it is a physical thing that bears within its covers the word itself. And so we carry it with great love and devotion from the holy table out the, uh, out the north door of the iconostas into the nave until we find ourselves standing then at the holy doors, the great gates before the holy table itself. We wait until the conclusion of the Beatitudes, at which point, if a deacon is present, he sings wisdom stand aright, um, calling the people to attention essentially, and then moves forward to replace the gospel on the holy table for the resumption of the service. Um, not long thereafter, then, uh, the gospel is um, announced. It is normally chanted, again, if a deacon is present, by a deacon, if not, then by the priest, after which a sermon is preached. Now, in Orthodox practice, the sermon uh, can actually be preached in a couple, at a couple of points in the liturgy. Normally, it's preached right after the proclamation of the gospel. So here you'll see preparation, small entrance, not long after the announcement of the gospel. I've said here the announcement of God's word in our midst. It's verbalized. And then the serving of God's word um, by, um, by explanation. Again, a verbal, um, a verbal act. After that, the service continues. The gates are closed and we undertake another preparation. The catechumens are dismissed. Then we sing the litany of the faithful and um, we move from the litany of the faithful into what's called the cherubic hymn. During the cherubic hymn, the great entrance is made. So the holy table is prepared, it's sensed, the gifts are sensed, the people are sensed, and the procession then takes place. This time, the procession is not with, as it was at the small entrance with the gospel book, this time it is with the, um, the elements of bread and wine on the discos in one hand, 
and the chalice in the other. During this, prep or during this entrance, during this procession, um, the various um, commemorations are made. So we pray for the whole church, we pray for the people of the church, um, we are uh, proclaiming uh, and praying for those uh, with whom we share communion in particular, because we are moving to the holy table to enter into Christ's ministry together with those who are both present and those who are not uh, physically present. Then the uh, gifts are set upon the holy table. A series of uh, the, 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 the creed is sung, a series of litanies are sung, and then the, the sort of we're approaching the pinnacle of the service, which is parallel, I'm suggesting this diagram, to the proclamation of the gospel, and that is the recitation, the praying of the anaphora. This time I've described that as making God's presence known sacramentally. So it's got that physical element that denotes a spiritual reality. Whereas when we announced the gospel, we were uh, making God's present known, presence known through verbal proclamation. And then um, I'm simply doing this for the sake of, of parallelism, but where the sermon was the serving of God's word, uh, the communion is the serving of God's presence. So there's a certain symmetry to the liturgical act. Two parts, and then each of those parts um, identifiable or um, uh, separatable into four different elements. So that isn't all, but I wonder if uh, people have experiences of this that we want to ask about or talk about. Um, I do know that this past Sunday, uh, those uh, who attended, um, especially those for whom it was new, um, were uh, full of questions about the liturgy of St. Basil, um, not least because it does extend the length of time we spend in the Divine Liturgy. But um, I want to open up the floor at this stage and uh, and engage in conversation. Are these uh, these entrances are the incarnation about Christ's earthly life walking through? Is this kind of what it is when he comes when the when the small entrance is with the with the word written? Very much so. You might say that the uh, small entrance is um, do you remember when I showed the uh, the slide that um, um, uh, illustrated the the movement of the word from Bethlehem towards the cross? You might say that the small entrance is that movement. And in fact, it's interesting if you um, are able to um, uh, poke your head into the into the altar of an Orthodox church, you'll see very often an icon of the incarnation over the prothesis table, the table of preparation. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the journey then from, from Bethlehem to Calvary. And so very much so. And then of course, um, our participation in the, um, in the communion is our participation in the life of Christ, the resurrected life of Christ. So um, it's like the second half. It, it quite literally is, is, you might say the, the, the um, the moment where I portrayed the cross in that illustration is um, is that moment of of uh, movement from from the first half of the life of Christ to the to the next. I'm sorry, I'm going to mispronounce your name, but is it uh, Trifon? Yeah, the same from the Assyria. <laughs> okay. Oh well, welcome. Um, go ahead. What what is your question? Uh, why in the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, we are uh, doing the litany that has Lord have mercy a lot. I think, and that is in fact true of, of both um, liturgies, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom and the liturgy of, of St. Basil. But Lord have mercy is, you might say in Orthodoxy, it's the um, most fundamental prayer. It's the prayer of the publican in the gospel of the publican and Pharisee. 
and it's it's very close to um, the Jesus prayer, the prayer of the heart, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our role is constantly to plead for God's mercy, not only for ourselves, but for the world. And so the series of petitions that we make across all of the various litanies, which draw on uh, or reflect all human need, um, are uh, acclimated by the whole church with the words, Lord have mercy. So it's as if we are entering into the act of the publican as one voice. So excellent question. Thank you very much for that. I hope that um, answers. Yeah, I think that that is answering my question. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you, Father. Anyone else? Father, yep. can I come in with an odd one? You certainly may. And it is an odd one. <laughs> um, you talk about the dismissal of the catechumens at that stage in the liturgy. Mm -hmm. But I have never, ever seen that actually done. Is that a practice that we have lost time? It is, but um, we lost it many, many centuries ago. In other words, it's not just That's something... That's what I thought, yeah. yeah it, is, it, is an, uh, it is a very early practice. Um, and uh, there were really a number of reasons for it. It actually falls outside of my uh, sort of field. So I couldn't give you a definitive answer as to why we did it. But the mystery was kept sacred by making sure that only those who were prepared to enter into it were physically present. And um, I'm sure that if we look at the earliest Christian practice, the earliest Christian liturgical practice, so for example, in the secret places, such as the catacombs or in the small house churches, um, some of which I think we looked at pictures of in an earlier session. But regardless, um, you know, th that space was really reserved for the participation of those who had been initiated in the mystery. And so if you can imagine a Christian community growing up, um, there's a wonderful picture. If you type in um, ancient Christian house church all in Google images, almost inevitably, um, there's a picture of a church in Syria that will come up and you can see how small that space is. And if you can imagine sort of the, you know, those inquiring, those who wanted to know more about the faith, sort of crowded towards the, the west end of the church, the, the, the entrance of the church, listening to the word mm -hmm. and then being told, okay, this bit now is for those who are fully initiated. You, you are dismissed. We're going to proceed. It's not unlike that. Now, in terms of the uh, uh, historic, uh, historical precision of what I've just described, I'm sure that uh, somebody who's better versed in, in early Christian liturgy will be able to uh, elaborate or even correct me. But I think that's not um, an, an inaccurate view of, of sort of what would have happened. But it does fade, especially in the post-Constantine church. In other words, after the fourth century, um, in, in the basilicas of... of the Christian world and the churches of the Christian world um, that draw, falls from from uh, Christian practice. So we maintain um, our connection with it, but uh, we don't actually go through with an, uh, with a dismissal. Yeah, excellent though. I mean, it's not it's not an odd question at all. It's brilliant. I can see that. Uh, I think it was uh, Steph who wrote, uh, "You beat me to it, Angela." So you were asking a question that was on other people's minds. Good. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, uh, Penny. Oh, you'll need to unmute. There we go. Uh, yes, Father. Um, as a Catholic, I find the Orthodox liturgy absolutely beautiful, but very difficult to follow okay. in terms of finding my place in the book. And, you know, um, is there um, a straightforward equivalent of a missal um, that you could recommend that you can follow the liturgy with, make it in with explanations as you go along and that sort of thing? There actually are. And what I'll do is I'll research which one is particularly appropriate. Um, one thing I would say, though, is that um, 
hopefully the, the model that we just looked at in terms of breaking the liturgy into parts can help you. I have told um, guests who have come to uh, St. Tylo or St. Theodore and St. Tylo's in the past. One thing I encourage is for people to enter into the mystery simply by watching, listening, um, having that sensory experience that comes with participation. Um, I know that you're more experienced than um, a complete novice. So um, uh, you're probably at a stage where you want to connect to the actions with, with the words. And in that case, uh, I know that there are materials and I'll be happy to, um, to search some out and then uh, get them into all of your hands. Um, so, but don't let me forget it. Uh, to the rest of you who don't know, Penny and I know each other and have for many years. So she'll be able to push me on this one. But uh, yeah, um, good question. In the meantime, and I know you'll have probably heard me say this, but to all of you, don't hesitate to go in. Even when you find yourself slightly bewildered by what's going on, try to remember that model so that you're in your mind, you can break down what's happening into the parts and realize then uh, where in the liturgy you are and what's happening. You may even know why, because to me, that, that is the great the glory of the liturgy is the fact that, you know, each one of these movements, each, you know, it's, it's not just about the words, it's about a whole, I'm going to call it a divine performance. Oh, you know, if we compare it to a theater, it is divine theater. It is sort of truth unfolded before our senses. And, um, and I would say as much as possible, allow yourself to be absorbed into that. But as I say, I also know when I'm talking to Penny that I'm not talking to somebody for whom this is all very new. So, um, uh, uh, that's more just general advice. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Father David. Um, just a question about these liturgies are fourth century um, Basil and, and Chrysostom, and and were they any ideas about the liturgies that were there before? Um, how how early did they come? And and are Basil's and uh, St. Chrysostom's um, an elaboration or a kind of a uh, <laughs> making it smaller or about the same size as what was going on before? Oh, wonderful question. Um, if you look at the origins of the liturgy, as liturgy emerges from Jerusalem or from uh, that part of the Eastern Mediterranean, it's, it's drawing on two fundamental sources, the temple, so the place of sacrifice and the synagogue, the place of word. Right? And um, as it is appropriated, I mean, in the first instance, Christians are, as you probably know, simply participating in synagogue life. Then we can assume afterward, they're going away from synagogue where they've heard the word and they're then breaking bread. Okay. Um, this synthesizes over a period of time um, and eventually, of course, especially outside of the Eastern Mediterranean world, Christians are not participating in synagogue. They're getting together on their own. We see that early enough because of Paul's own letters, St. Paul's own letters. And we realize that there is quite a Christian diaspora. And um, consequently, we can assume that that synthesis happens relatively quickly. And Christians are, are sort of left to their own devices. In other words, they're no longer meeting in synagogues within about a century of, of the ascension or, or of, of Pentecost. And uh, that being the case, they are um, fairly quickly um, elaborating on the basic prayers. There are theories about um, Paul's account of the uh, Last Supper, that it becomes something of a core to various anaphorae, plural for anaphora. Um, but uh, funny enough, I know that uh, in one, at least one of the uh, Syrian liturgies, there is no institution narrative. In other words, there is no direct evocation of our Lord's words at the Last Supper. So it's not absolute. You get different Eucharistic prayers in different places. But um, you look at the prayer of St. Hippolytus, um, on which in the West, uh, um, Eucharistic prayer number two is ostensibly based. 
um, you, it's, it's quite a short and simple prayer, but it includes the institution words. It includes various elements. Um, by the fourth century, you have the essential elements, which include the words of institution and anamnesis. For those of you who don't know what that means, it's a recollection of why we do what we do. It means a remembrance of. So um, uh, I know that uh, the Eucharistic prayer of the Book of Common Prayer very much includes the anamnesis, the words of institution. In the East, you get an explicit epiclesis, a calling of the Holy Spirit as part of that prayer. All of these things develop. In other words, there's not simply a moment at which um, uh, the anaphora of St. Basil appears in its fullness, um, and we can say, right, there, there it is in the year 273. Um, rather, it's a more organic process, and by the uh, late fourth century, we can actually say that, okay, there is Basil, and, and only slightly later, there is John Chrysostom. Anything else? I want you to feel free, but I'm going to say one more thing about um, the Divine Liturgy um, in particular, and that is perhaps more of, uh, more of an inspiring point, at least I hope it is. The Liturgy has incredible power in a disenchanted world to re-enchant. And what I mean is this. Over 30 years ago, when I first went through the process of discernment to eventually um, become ordained as a priest in the Anglican Church, I went through a series of examinations. And my first was with a group of chaplains in my Anglican diocese, at which they asked me why I thought the New Age movement, which was at the time a significant uh, feature in Western life, why I thought the New Age movement seemed to have the appeal it had. And I thought for a moment and reflected on the fact that in the 1980s, when I was a teenager, Dungeons and Dragons was a phenomenon. And Dungeons and Dragons had a certain um, appeal because, well, I'm not gonna give it because, I'm gonna describe a situation. I went to a friend's house not long before Christmas and we were going to gather there, about four or five of us. And I went into his front room and all the lights in the house were off except the Christmas tree lights. That in itself created a wonderful atmosphere. You know, that warm glow of Christmas lights on a snowy Canadian night. But we went then downstairs where the room was set up for a game of Dungeons and Dragons. I was probably 13 or 14 at the time. But the room had uh, burning candles and a stick of Chinese incense burning. And I smiled to myself because even as I saw this, I thought to myself, I get this for real every week. I then re uh, recounted that to my examining chaplains and said at that time, I thought one of the reasons the new age or the new age um, pursuits, practices and, and thought had such appeal at the time was because people were yearning for mystery, for, um, for uh, enchantment in a world that was so otherwise materialistic. And because in so many instances, people had turned away from the church, left the church, or not even known about the church to begin with, they didn't know it could be found there. And even as I answered the question, I convinced myself of its reality. So as I was first ordained and stood on the altar, I sought to do exactly what I thought um, people were, were searching for and perhaps had not found elsewhere. 
I know that uh, Father David, who was my archdeacon at the time, will remember sort of the emphasis that I placed on liturgy. And it wasn't because, at least I hope it wasn't because, it was an aesthetic exercise. It was because I truly believe in the power of liturgy to convert, to draw people into the enchantment that is the Christian reality. And you can see this time and time again. Last night, I was um, with my live catechism class in the parish, and I was reflecting on um, a Guns N' Roses song, believe it or not, uh, Paradise City. And if any of you, <laughs> I see that uh, Trifon knows that, um, the video for that shows, um, you know, people gathering for a concert. And then, um, you know, the, 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 the thousands of people in a stadium. And as you're watching it, what are you seeing? Except liturgy itself, in the sense that people are gathering together in a common ritual with a common goal. And as the band performs on stage, they are essentially serving in the capacity of priests. I hope that doesn't sound blasphemous. I'm trying to draw a, a, um, a picture that underscores just how much we as human beings, our very souls long for the mystical reality that the church proffers in liturgy. And so this conversation is one I see of utmost importance, not just because it's important, obviously, to understand what we're doing when we participate in the church's life, but because it has unspeakable evangelical potential. The people of the world, all of us, are hungry, and God proffers us the food we are looking for. We just um, need to be helped and reminded to know that it's in the church, it's from the altar of God that we receive it. And I find that terribly exciting, but also um, encouraging, because as we get on with what the church is meant to do, we're doing something of supreme evangelical importance. Pauline, you have to unmute yourself. Right. Um, no, it was just to pass a comment mm -hmm. on what you just said. When I um, became a Roman Catholic uh, about 12 years ago now, um, I was quite appalled to find that a lot of the services were very sterile. Mm. There is there is no mystery, um, and I do find that an awful lot of the people who just who just go to church on a Sunday, mm. and that is the sum total of their their input, that they they're just going through the motions, and when you talk to them, they say the church has no relevance today. It doesn't speak to us, um, but obviously we know we must we must continue to go to church. Mm -hmm. I sympathise with what you've said. Um, not, not all not all of them are like that, I must say, but so, a lot of them are. Yeah, there is definitely, and and I'm sure we would find that in many quarters. But yes, I do think that that is a criticism that people have made of particularly uh, Roman Catholic practice in the last number of decades. Um, you're also not alone in that observation. Uh, I guess one of the things that informed me is when I was um, preparing uh, at seminary, we went on our annual um, seminarians retreat and the retreat leader one year, we were uh, by Lac MacDonald in, in Northern Quebec. Uh, on a lake, just uh, an exquisite venue. We're sitting on the porch, all of us seminarians, um, and the retreat leader uh, said, I want you all to close your eyes and imagine yourself as priests. And within a two seconds said, now open your eyes. If you didn't see yourself at the altar first, then perhaps your vocation is not to the sacramental priesthood. 
he wasn't um, trying to cause division or to um, unnerve anyone. He was simply saying that the role of the sacramental priest, the, the person or the people who are ordained is, uh, is primarily to stand on the altar and to serve liturgically because there's almost nothing else that the church does that we all don't do as Christians, full stop. And therefore it's incumbent on those who serve liturgy to do so as prayerfully, as beautifully as they can, because beauty is prayer. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems to me that, you know, as long as we do that, even when mistakes are made, even when, then we are fulfilling a profound, well, first of all, the, as I've already ex, uh, suggested, the, the, the service of the church, the service par excellence, but equally addressing profound human longing. And uh, that's why I think, you know, it, it is extremely important that we do, uh, we make sure the liturgy serves, serves mystery and, and, and invites people more deeply into the mystery because um, when we fail to do that we're actually not necessarily accomplishing the um, the role that is set before us so no thank you for that i'm just going to read a question in the chat that's come in um okay uh do i know if there is any reason why in some orthodox churches there is a very generous usage of the sign of the cross uh my experience in some churches in russia was that many people would make the sign of the cross at every Lord have mercy, which is a lot. That's more a matter of local tradition. Um, I know that uh, in many of the Slavic churches I've uh, visited or even just observed, for example, on YouTube, um, people will cross themselves. Um, I'm thinking specifically of the deacon, for example, when he is singing the various petitions of litanies. Um, he's actually instructed or trained because he's holding his orarian, his the equivalent of a stole in the West, because he's holding that up with his right hand, as he offers a petition, he's crossing himself. And then his hand is going back to that indicative position that he holds it in for most of the most of the uh, the service. And I think then that carries over to the people's own practice. And uh, it's it's but it's principally a pious practice as opposed to a necessary one because you don't see it in every orthodox church it will entirely depend so the answer is basically um that it is 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 that it is local as opposed to any sort of rule the generous use of the sign of the cross however is i don't think to be frowned upon it's uh well not least because it's a blessing as we make the sign of the cross, we are engaging in a, in a type of prayer. It's a physical prayer. And so I would never begrudge anyone doing it. But I think that people have picked up on it from the practice of the deacon, whom they can see standing before the royal doors, leading the people in prayer and crossing himself with his orarium at every petition. Good. I know that liturgical questions spring to mind um, on the part of almost everyone who attends. And in that respect, perhaps more than any other topic we've covered, you will find you go away and have more questions and you want to pose them. I can't encourage that strongly enough. Clearly, roughly 50 minutes of coverage of the liturgy in the discussion is never going to touch on everything we want to touch on. So one of the ideas I have is that after Pascha, we will, uh, I will put out an advertisement for more sessions and we can get together and focus particularly on the liturgy if that's something people would find helpful and interesting. But in the meantime, uh, my inbox is always open and I would just ask you to feel free to get in touch with me with any questions you may have. Hopefully today was not so pithy that uh, it didn't have some gems in it. I hope that you go away with some uh, something to think about. And um, we have one more session that takes place at this time next Wednesday. Uh, we will be looking at um, the church in diaspora 
and and the idea of mission. So we'll talk about that. We'll touch a little bit on the history of my own diocese, but not in an exclusive way, just as it fits into a bigger picture of Christian mission and Christianity as it moves out of the European world into, for example, the new world. So that's what we look forward to. Thank you all very, very much for being here. And um, God bless. I look forward to seeing you next week.